Hello, everyone. So we're very fortunate we survived Friday the 13th during a pandemic. So we still have our fortunate, precious human rebirth. So today I would like to add a kind of PS to the talk that I gave last week, exactly one week ago. Um, so in that talk, I read a poem by a uh, Sufi master and mystic um, and poet named Rumi, and the name of the poem was The Guest House. And basically what this poem is saying, it's advice for uh, how to deal with uh, emotions that come up in us, whether they're pleasant ones or unpleasant ones, like anger or depression. Um, so the advice he gives is to welcome them in the same way that a, a manager of a guest house would welcome anybody who comes to stay. So having a welcoming, friendly attitude and even feeling grateful uh, for these guests in our mind. Um, he didn't specifically say this, but I think what he means is because um, these are opportunities for spiritual growth, for progressing along the spiritual path. And uh, I mentioned that this kind of approach is quite different than what we sometimes come across in traditional Buddhist teachings, uh, where we are often advised to have mindfulness and introspection at the door of our mind and immediately cut off any afflictive emotions that might arise. So I just wanted to clarify that well, I, I, I didn't mean to intend that I'm disparaging or rejecting that kind of advice. It may have sounded like that, so that's why I was concerned and I wanted to talk about this again this, this time. So I wasn't saying that I don't agree with that advice, because I myself have found it very helpful in, in certain situations. Especially when you're trying to meditate, if you're trying to concentrate on whatever long term topic or your breath or Buddha. Um, when you're trying to develop concentration, it's recommended that you don't allow anything else to come into your mind. You don't allow your mind to go to any other object. They say even a virtuous object, you know, like if you're trying to develop calm abiding concentration, on whatever object, you have a meditation object, you're supposed to stay with that object and not let your mind go to any other object. Even if a virtuous, beautiful, wonderful thing arises in your mind, you're supposed to say, no, not now, <laughs> and just come back to your object. And that's because you're trying to develop concentration. You're trying to familiarize your mind with staying on one single object for longer and longer periods of time. So in that kind of practice, then it is important to stop anything else that comes into your mind. Um, <clears throat> but there is a danger in that approach because, uh, you know, sometimes there are painful emotions, disturbing thoughts, memories coming up in our mind that might need to be given attention. We might need to give attention to those, look at them. And if we just chop them off, then it may be that we are denying, suppressing, just saying, I don't want to deal with this. And we keep doing that. It can actually lead to other problems. It can lead to sickness, physical problems, also mental problems. So there is that danger of just continuously suppressing things that might actually be uh, important to look at and work on. But another thing is, um, sometimes it's just not possible. <laughs> you know, sometimes these disturbing emotions or thoughts or memories come up in such a strong way, they're like a tsunami wave or like a volcanic eruption, you know, and you just can't stop them, however hard you try. They just need, and my take on that is they need to be looked at. I like to use the analogy of a crying child. I mean, if a child is crying, what do you do? Do you say, shut up, <laughs> or slap the child, uh, or run away, or send the child away? I mean, that's very unkind, very uncompassionate. So I think of, you know, strong, disturbing thoughts and emotions coming up in our mind as being like a crying child. 
and they need to be looked at. They need to be treated with compassion and kindness. And we need to understand, what's this all about? What's going on here? In the same way you do with a child, you know, the most compassionate thing is to pay attention to the child and try to understand why why the child is crying. And then you can understand how to help the child, how to soothe its its pain or its fear, or maybe it needs to be taken to the doctor. (laughs) So understand the reason. Then you can deal with it skillfully. So I think the same thing needs to be done sometimes with uh, things within our own mind. Sometimes they really do need to be looked at and understood, and then we can know how to deal with them. And and we do find this kind of uh, approach in Buddhism, like I mentioned last time, One traditional practice is the practice of patience, and specifically uh, the patience of voluntarily accepting suffering. So when painful things happen in our mind, that's an example of suffering. That's a kind of suffering. And uh, so it's actually a practice to accept this situation and learn to deal with it, you know, in in a skillful way rather than just cutting it off. So in that way, we have a chance to increase our practice of patience and create virtue and progress along the path. And then there's also the practice of um, lojong, thought transformation. Uh, Specifically within that, the practice of transforming problems into the path. Um, So when problems happen inside of us, this is an opportunity for us to use different methods. We can think about karma, we can think about compassion, we can do tolen, we can remember karma, uh, I mentioned that already, renunciation, uh, the determination to be free. So there's all kinds of methods or techniques we can use uh, to deal with this internal suffering, this internal problem, and make it part of our practice, transform it into the path. Um, But also, um, there's a few contemporary teachers who, who talk about such a method. For example, Thich Nhat Hanh, he talks about dealing with problems and disturbing emotions in a very gentle, kind, and compassionate way, and also Pema Chodron. So so this doesn't mean when we, uh, you know, welcome disturbing thoughts and emotions, like I said last time, it doesn't mean that we let them take over our mind and we let ourselves become their slave and we do whatever they tell us to do, including, you know, non-virtue. That's, that's not the meaning, but rather it's just, okay, look, what's happening in my mind? Isn't this interesting? You know, I have a curiosity about it and, and a kindness as well. And then you know, try to understand what is this all about? Why is it there? Where is it coming from? And we can learn a great deal in that way. And that's that's my own experience. <clears throat> um, so the point I'm trying to make today is Buddhism isn't a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. <laughs> it isn't that there's one way to practice that everybody should do at all times, and you should never deviate from that. I, kind of, I think I had that idea when I first started learning Buddhism. I was learning it from Tibetan lamas, and I had this idea that, oh, I have to be just like them, like a carbon copy, a photocopy of my, of my teachers. And I was trying really hard to be just like them, and I got a terrible case of lung. It really made myself sick, and it took me a while to realize, no, you know. And also just looking at different practitioners, you know, they do practice in different ways. So that helped me see that, oh, okay, I need to get to know myself and find out what works for me and what doesn't work for me and practice accordingly. So the way I see it is there are these different methods, these different techniques for what to do in situations where disturbing thoughts and emotions are coming up in our mind. And you don't have to feel obliged to do what somebody else is doing or what somebody else is advised, is advising, even if it's a great master. Like Shanti Deva or Dalai Lama or Lama Zopa Rinpoche or whoever it is, you know, okay, that's what they say and that's what works for them, but maybe it won't work for me. You can try it out, but you might need to find some other method, some other technique that does work more, you know, effectively for you. So feel free to do that. Feel free to experiment and find what works for you, what fits you. <laughs> 
And also it could change at different times. You know, at one point in time, one practice might be more effective, but at another time, another practice might be more effective. So feel free to experiment. And I think, too, Rumi's advice could be very helpful for us right now in this situation that's happening in the world with the um, pandemic, the coronavirus, and also the stock market going up and down. These are kind of big problems as well as lots of other problems happening. So in these, in these times, in this situation, we might find ourselves feeling anxiety or fear or sorrow, sadness. Um, so there could be disturbing thoughts, emotions coming up in our mind. So if that's the case, accept them. You know, don't pretend they're not there. Don't pretend that you're something that you're not, like you're a Buddha and you don't have any emotions coming up in your mind. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't work. We have to be real. We have to be um, you know, realistic about what's really happening in our mind. And also don't beat yourself up. You know, and think I'm a lousy practitioner because I'm feeling anxious or I'm feeling uh, sad or whatever. So be honest with yourself, be kind to yourself, and see what you can learn from these experiences, from these thoughts and emotions that are coming up in the mind. Remember, they can be brought into the path and used in the path to further our, our positive qualities, kindness, compassion, wisdom, and help us get closer to enlightenment and be more helpful for others. I wanted to appreciate um, your BBC last week and this week that uh, it reminded me of, like, uh, it's, for me, it's, it's this kind of practice is very helpful. Uh, how I translate it in my mind is when these things come up, is this is dukkha. And dukkha is to be <coughs> identified, to be known. So as the guest house master, I now know my guest. And that's, and it's very clean. And once I can get that, whatever afflictions come, I'm not afraid because this is dukkha. I was thinking as you were talking about um, how much I appreciate that uh, Thich Nhat Hanh teaches the four establishments of mindfulness. And I've read his, his, uh, that's one of his main practices. And I think he's very traditional to how it's taught in both the Sanskrit and the Pali, I mean, the way I understand it. Um, so I think there is a, is a big tradition of um, just the way, I, the, only, the way I understand it is you don't want to suppress or express. You want to have awareness. And so I, I feel like that's been very helpful for me who I used to suppress emotions. I wasn't trying to, I just did. Uh, and then so I had to make a lot of space for them. But then there's also the difficulty if they overwhelm the mind, then they're like splattering and you're getting yourself in a lot of trouble. So for me, it was really helpful, a, a practice that I think that we learned first from Tenzin Kacho, uh, where you actually it is this really what Thich Nhat Hanh does is he teaches you to calm the mind first. And the twist that he makes on it is he teaches a person how to be joyful first so that they actually have a kind of a good base. And then after that, he goes into the, the mindfulness of, um, that relates to the mental factors. And I think that's a really good idea because if you don't have enough kind of stability in the mind and you can find a place that's peaceful and you know calm and joyful then it can be difficult and you could easier more easily fall to suppressing things but that's one thing I why I like that practice is because it's it's very much just observing and then trying to find the impermanence of these mental factors or the unsatisfactoriness of them or the um, non-self, I guess. Yeah, one other thing, um, I think that the advice uh, about cutting the disturbing thoughts and emotions as soon as they arise, I think that's really more for an advanced practitioner who's really studied and has a very good familiarity with the path and is really committed to going all the way to enlightenment or liberation and so on. 
And so, the, and they've probably already come to a very firm conviction that these disturbing thoughts and emotions are hindrances to that. But if we're still at the beginning of the path and we're not completely sure about those things, if we just try to follow that advice, it may not be effective. And so I think we, it is helpful to explore our disturbing thoughts and emotions and come to see for ourselves firsthand how they are disturbing and how they are hindrances so that when we are working towards liberation, enlightenment, or even calm abiding, you know, we're coming from a place of conviction that these are harmful and I'm not going to let myself get under their control. But before that point, we do need to kind of explore them and get to know them ourselves. I think you're really right on with that. And where I'm a little confused in the four establishments of mindfulness is these, I for, spent some time reading just the Pali commentators on this, and what I, what I did learn was that there's kind of like, there's different ways where they go about it, but what's a little confusing to me is when they're trying to bring a person to have concentration, and it seems, for my mind, it was too early. Like, I needed to, when I tried to do that, I had a lot of difficulty in retreat, and I think it's exactly that, that it was better for me to take the approach of mindfulness where I had the awareness of them rather than trying to just force my mind to stay on something. That didn't go so well for me. And I think that to be able to, yeah, I think it's, you know, I think you have to have like a lot in place before you want to try to do that. I think you're really right on that. But I'm, I'm confused as to, I think they have kind of different approaches. At least in Buddha Dasa, he goes really quickly to uh, concentration and if you were a, a beginner or pretty new, I think it would, I think it's hard <laughs> for what you, just for the reasons you spoke about. And I do want to say that I also have uh, inappropriate attention regarding the way in which I look at things. It's the pre, the, it's just before the afflictions arise where I start talking mostly out of a mental habit that has been a prior coping mechanism, that I can start talking to myself in a way that brings the afflictions up. So I've learned that when I start describing things inaccurately, that I need to be a little bit firmer about drop it, rather than waiting until I believe what I'm saying and then the afflictions arise. So they're just old mental habits. I pretty much have understood what the source of them is. So I, sometimes I do need to be a little bit firmer with myself when I'm in the conceptualization piece before I'm in the afflicted state. Yeah, so I think, you know, the practice of mindfulness is really, really helpful for us just to be able to watch our mind and get to know the, the way our mind works. And then we're in a better position of, you know, dealing in an appropriate way with our own particular mental habits. So we should probably stop there, but thank you for all your comments and